I spoke in a different language. And uh, uh, in fact, I teach uh, not quite at the University of Montreal, but at the Université de Montréal. I teach in a French language university. And it's very unusual for me to give a lecture in English. Uh, moreover, since it is not my native tongue, uh, if there are any questions and something is not clear, uh, do not hesitate to ask right after the end of the sentence. Don't wait till the end of the lecture. Um, I would be happy to clarify things that may be uh, unclear. Um, the lecture uh, deals with the evolution of Israeli society uh, and it's called From Left to Right. I must admit that it's a topic that interested me two or three years ago and I, this particular lecture I have given in various places and uh, a lengthier version of this is available on the internet. If you Google Yakov Rapkin from left to right, you'll get a Japanese page, don't worry, <laughs> published in Japan, but in English. So, but first you'll see the Japanese hieroglyphics, uh, but that's the fate of many academics. They're published in different countries. So as you know, in its pioneer years, uh, Israel, oh it wasn't Israel, in fact a Zionist movement, uh, was associated with leftist ideas of collective endeavor, of socialist ideology, of kibbutz. Uh, the most active uh, pioneers of the Zionist settlement in Palestine were Russian speakers from the Russian Empire uh, who wanted to create a new society uh, and um, their effort uh, was directed at building a socialist society in Palestine among Zionist settlers of Palestine and here begins one of the interesting paradoxes. They say, we want to build a socialist society, but not among Arabs. So the local population was left outside of the project of society. It was concerning only <coughs> the new settlers of Rome, uh, from the Russian Empire, essentially. And it is, that's why we have to talk about a non-Arab social project. And the word that was used at that time in the early 20s by uh, leaders of the Zionist movement was afrada, afrada meaning suppression. Uh, and uh, indeed, this is a, a very important basic paradox of the socialist uh, experience in Palestine because you will see this paradox is going to return to the forefront quite often. Um, of course, this pioneer socialist experiment was uh, admired by socialists and communists around the world. In fact, uh, there were very close links between the Soviet uh, Soviet-directed commentary and, uh, and uh, Zionist pioneers in Palestine. Uh, there were also close links, as we know now, for the, the, with the Soviet secret services and who uh, worked in Palestine. Uh, so the connections were so close, in fact, that in 1926, a group of socialist pioneers from Palestine returned to the Soviet Union because they were deciding whether they want to build socialism in Palestine or they should rather help the socialist experiment in the Soviet Union. Their identities were, their loyalties were split. And uh, they found that 
their place was in the Soviet Union, which was governed by the communist government, and, and therefore uh, they abandoned Palestine. I'm mentioning that because you have to realize the mood, the spirit uh, of the time. Uh, so, Zionist ideology, in fact, does not come at all from the left wing. Um, we can talk about the founders of Jewish Zionism at the end of the 19th century, uh, belonging to the haute bourgeoisie, you know, the bourgeoisie of, of France, Germany, Austria. Herzog himself was aspired to be a member of the higher class in Austria. And uh, socialists played a very insignificant role among the leaders of the political, of political science. But they played a dominant role among the settlers in Palestine. I remind you that Thurda Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, uh, died in 1904, so in fact he didn't see much of the settlement, and he didn't have a very close relationship to the settlers. Uh, so these, uh, but Herzl was influenced by Protestant thinking, by Christian Protestant thinking. Uh, I may remind you that his first idea, the first idea of Herzl's was to solve the Jewish problem, the Judenfrage, as he would put it, uh, by converting all Jews of Vienna into Catholicism. Apparently, the Bishop of Vienna wasn't very hot at uh, this performance that Herzl already planned, and so the second best was the, the idea of Zionism. But the Zionism, in fact, did not originate with Herzl. Uh, the idea of ingathering Jews without the arrival of Messiah, before the arrival of Messiah, is an idea that was very common in uh, Protestant circles, particularly English Protestant circles in Britain and the United States. I wrote a whole article about it. If you want to know more, uh, it's available. Again, it's available on the internet, like most other things. Um, and in fact, we know that in Vienna, Herzl was influenced by a Protestant minister with the British Embassy in Vienna, with whom he was very close. And there is a book written in French but translated into English. It's called The Prince and the Prophet, uh, about this close relationship between Herzl and this Protestant minister. Uh, so the this Protestant origin uh, of Zionism is important to remember because it played and continues to play a very important role in the support of Israel and Jews even today. The evangelicals in the United States and other countries, uh, the fundamentalist Christian groups are the main pillar of support for Israel in the United States. Stephen Harper. Stephen Harper is his church, I know, it's very supportive. That's why Stephen Harper and Canada and Cole are against, uh, in such a case, uh, Palestine uh, as a state with, without negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about it. Yeah. The Baptist? Yeah. Baptist? Oh, yes. Well, we have a government in Canada directed by Stephen Harper who perhaps is the number one supporter of Israel in the world. Yeah, and Ukraine, Ukraine as well. And Ukraine, and well, yes, uh, today's Ukraine. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand that it stems from an ideological commitment rooted in uh, this Protestant worldview, but not only. Okay. We can talk in the question period about that if you like. Uh, so the um, socialists uh, were the backbone, as I said, of the Zionist movement, but for the Socialist International, it was not natural to support a nationalist movement. It was difficult, and I will quote 
that uh, some of the documents of the Socialist International say we recognize the historic right of the Jewish people to settle in Palestine, therefore they equated Zionists with Jews, which is a, quite a leap for the same socialists who consider Jews to be equal citizens of their own countries. Uh, and the second they write, the social Zionists declared themselves, that's in this partners, I quote, in the social revolutionary movement which seeks to end exploitation, national servitude, the rule of man over man, and people over people. That's the rhetoric of, uh, of the left-wing Zionist movement. Uh, and uh, in fact, Socialist International was a very important source of support for the young state of Israel. Today, actually, it's the independence state of Israel. Uh, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, um, and this support continued for about three decades. Now, at the same time, and that's very important to understand, at the same time, uh, Zionist leaders like Chaim Weizmann, who also comes from the Russian Empire, and Ben Gurion, who comes also from the Russian Empire, uh, uh, were perfectly aware of the nature of Zionism. And they, uh, in fact, particularly Chaim Weizmann, mobilized support from British elites. Uh, we know the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was written by uh, then minister in the British cabinet. What we don't know, or what most people don't know, is that Balfour was one of the proponents of a restricting legislation in 1906 to forbid Russian Jews to settle in Britain. But he comes from the same fundamentalist Protestant circles, and therefore, in his mind, the place of the Hebrews is in Palestine. Their place is not in Britain, their place is in Palestine. And just as if I mentioned that Balfour Declaration, uh, you can look up on the internet uh, uh, the reaction of the only Jewish member of the cabinet, Montague, to the Balfour Declaration. Montague. Uh, uh, he, he vigorously protested against that. It's quite instructive to read it, but today the topic is not Jewish opposition to Zionism, and I'm mentioning it because I mentioned about the declaration. So one of the people who was uh, contacted by Chaim Weizmann was Winston Churchill. And that's what Winston Churchill, and, and the reasons given by Weizmann uh, were that Zionism will distract politically active Jews from socialism. So if you, do, if you develop nationalism among Jews, they'll be less active in socialist and communist movements. And Winston Churchill, reacting to that, wrote, and I quote, the international Jews, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development, of envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing. It becomes therefore specially important to foster and develop any strongly marked Jewish movement which leads directly away from these fatal associations. As it is here that Zionism has such deep significance for the whole world at the present time, wrote Churchill. So I repeat, he says that there is a world conspiracy of Jews to destroy civilization through communist and socialist activities, and Zionism is an antidote that would prevent, would distract Jews, as he puts it, from, um, from class struggle, as we would put it as well. Uh, so that's why Zionism uh, was, in fact, rejected. Uh, 
by quite a few people as a reactionary movement, as a reactionary nationalism. So you have this two parallel pictures, one the social experiments, the kibbutz, uh, the new forms of social uh, organization, for example, uh, what was happening in Israel in Palestine in the 1920s was very similar to what was happening uh, here in the 1920s. The marriage was a bourgeois prejudice, uh, there was free unions, uh, all of these wonderful things were happening at the same time uh, uh, in Palestine. Imagine how traditional Jews and Arabs looked at that. And they were totally horrified by the, the experiment. Um, so, um, in the, early, in the early years, as I said, uh, uh, socialism was the dominant ethos of the Zionist movement. But at the same time, I quoted, I mentioned Chaim Weizmann and Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion, who was on the ground, who was in Palestine, who was directing the Zionist settlement, he was perfectly aware that socialism is only instrumental. It's an instrument to conquer the land. And he writes, we are conquerors of the land facing a wall of iron and we have to break through it. And he, in my book I mentioned, in my book incidentally is also translated into Russian and you can find it, you can find it free of charge on the internet, the first one. And for today we checked it for 100 hryvna in Ukrainian, in, in, uh, on the website of the publisher. So it's, it's available in Russian as well, in case you read it better than English. Uh, the second one doesn't yet exist in English. It exists in Japanese, Russian. Uh, so going back to Ben-Gurion's expression, it's important to understand that he used the word iron wall before Jabotinsky, who was actually credited with this. So this instrumental role makes sense if you think of it. The early Zionist settlers uh, were excluding local population, trying to settle the land. Sometimes in one of the heroic myths of Zionist history is what they call Homao Migdal, the wall and the wow. and tower. Uh, that's how, according to Ottoman law, and the British maintain that law, you come and you build a, a settlement, you put a tower, and it's considered legal presence, legitimate presence. Excuse me, what year it was? His words. During the British mandate. But, but, bef that. but before Jabotinsky. Are you talking about the Iron Wall? Or yeah, yeah, Iron Wall. Iron Wall, one year before Jabotinsky. Uh -huh. He wrote it. Uh, Jabotinsky wrote in 23 and the Ben Gurion said in 22, I think. Um, again, I quote it in my book, and it's, it's all found in the book by Zev Sternheil whom I will mention later, Zev Stenil is an emeritus professor at the Hebrew University in Israel. Uh, and he wrote a book about these early years, uh, which in English is called The Founding Myths of Israel. Uh, When I started saying the Chomal Migdal, when you settlers came, they occupied the land, they put uh, a fence, so they put a tower, but you can only do it in a group, you cannot do it alone. You have to have a group, you have to have a kibbutz. So collective settlement was the only way to conquer the land. It could not be conquered by individuals. Uh, and we could see that in, 
experiences of many countries where you had to have some kind of a collective action. So, uh, uh, it, again, we find a very interesting paradox that on the one hand, socialism is only instrumental, but it's perceived as the dominant ideology. And at the same time, Herzl wrote uh, in his diary that anti-Semites will be our most loyal friends and allies. So you see that, uh, in fact, you have uh, this paradox continuing throughout uh, the history of uh, the Zionist movement. Uh, and in fact, uh, we'll, we can talk about we can talk about it during the question period. Uh, many of the right wing and extreme right wings in Europe, in that Israel nationalist movements, admire Israel. Uh, and most of these movements, they recently were overtly anti-Semitic. Uh, today, they're toned down the rhetoric, but they are the groups say, in Holland, in France. Uh, who are pro-Israel, but they have anti-Semitic antecedents. And I'm wondering why I'm saying the word but through the end. Uh, just logically, I'm saying but, but it, it's not quite logical, because for anti-Semites it was important to get the Jews out of Europe, and for the Zionists it was important to get Jews out of Europe. So they worked more or less on the same purpose. And in fact, we see that, and that's also an interesting page in history, um, we know all about the genocide against Jews uh, in, in the early 40s in, in Europe. What we know less, but Israeli scholars are very attentive to that, is how Zionist movement related to the uh, rise of Nazism in Germany. And yep. Before I continue, I have a question uh, about the 1926, uh, when Ashley told part of the Zionists came back to USSR, are there any additional information about those people, um, what their activity was like back in USSR? So did they, for instance, I know, take part in uh, creating um, those commonwealths, um, in, in, in deep west uh, of uh, yeah, in Europe, Germany, yeah, yeah. or what anything parties, else. What parties so, they were. Yeah. what were the, these people? Well, uh, I personally didn't research it. I think there are several articles available about on that subject. Uh, if you like, I can try to find them. Uh, what I do know is uh, some of them were active in, in fact. Uh, founding Birobijan, which I visited last year, and so I could see that, uh, coming from Japan. So <laughs> many Jews there. Uh, there, uh, there were never more than 25% of Jews in Birobijan, I was told. Today it's a much lower, much lower percentage. But it has become, it's very, it has become part of the, identity of that area. It's, it's very interesting. It's still official language. You still have bilingual street signs in Russian yeah, yeah. and Yiddish in Drobichan. You have uh, at the uh, train station, of course, a huge menorah uh, and, and a monument to what looks like Tevye de Milchike. Uh, so there's a lot of that uh, present and of course there are two synagogues that don't get along, which is perfectly normal for the Jewish community. As far as I know, there are around 34 uh, communities, different Jewish communities in Germany. Well, they officially were recognized in 34, but it began in the late 20s and uh, in Khabarovsk, mm -hmm. you know, over there. So, uh, uh, so I mentioned that, well, you asked me, uh, some of them became active also in agricultural colonies here in Ukraine. The uh, Krim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's a very interesting story. Actually, a Japanese colleague of mine wrote about uh, relations between 
the Joint Distribution Committee and uh, and these colonies. So, if you like, again, I, I know that particular Japanese colony. Who, the Japanese are very interested in Jewish studies. Actually, we should bring some of them here. Uh, and they speak. Actually, one of them speaks Yiddish. Okay. So uh, let's go back to what I was saying about Nazism. Uh, and now, the reaction of the uh, the reaction of the Jewish organization in, to Nazism was, as understandably, negative, except the Zionist Federation of Germany, which welcomed the arrival of Nazism. And the head of it, Rabbi Yohanan Prinz, wrote, uh, extolled the end of liberalism and wrote a book, Wir Juden, We Jews, in which he actually uh, explained that the ethnic nationalism of Germans facilitates the work of the Zionists because it makes clear who is German, who is Jewish, and therefore uh, they uh, greeted the arrival of Nazism. Moreover, uh, the Zionist Federation of Germany invited uh, the SS, one of the leaders of SS, to visit Palestine. He went to Palestine. Uh, and she wrote articles about that, and even a medal was minted uh, uh, to commemorate that visit. Uh, and it says, I Nazi nach Palestine, a Nazi travels to Palestine, and you see a swastika on one side and Magin David on the other. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in that, the Israeli documentary made three years ago called The Flat uh, talks all about it. Uh, Israelis are very good at unearthing this kind of information. Uh, incidentally, Adolf Heifman, uh, who was brought to Israel in 1961 to, to face trial, it was not his first visit. The first visit was 1937. And he told that he knew Hebrew, I guess. Or well, some words. That, that by itself is not, uh, but he studied it. He studied it, I think, I, I, either Yiddish or Hebrew. That's some rabbi, a rabbi, I, I, I Right, right. Quite possible, quite possible. But you can see that the Rabbi Prince who wrote this, Rabbi uh, Newton, that book, uh, may have been uh, sort of misled. But in 1937, when he emigrated from, from Germany, and he was, I think, in Britain or in the United States, he wrote, I quote him, we were treated by, this, by the Nazis as the favorite children of the Nazi government. And he met the Zionist movement. In fact, there were camps to organize, to train the Mohammed Akshara, the common Hebrew, camps to train agriculture, for, to recycle Jews for agriculture, because they were mostly doctors and lawyers. <laughs> they had to be recycled into agriculture. Uh, also, there were quite interesting episodes about the concept of Jewish race, um, that prominent uh, uh, Zionist leaders uh, considered Jews in the diaspora to be degenerate, and that oh, fits perfectly with the rhetoric uh, of, the, of the Nazi movement, as uh, my colleague Professor Falk at the Hebrew University uh, documented in several articles. So you see that there is tensions between left and right, between nationalists supported by the right and extreme right, and the left wing experience. These tensions continue throughout, but finally they come to a resolution. And they came to a resolution uh, in the last, so say, 30 years of, uh, in Israel. Uh, the, we could see that the first time that the Socialist the Labour Party in Israel lost power was in 1977. Mm -hmm. And uh, that brought a lot of changes into Israeli society. Uh, incidentally, um, Menachem Begin, who uh, was elected Prime Minister uh, in 1977, had been called fascist by no less individuals like Albert Einstein and Hannah Arendt, who protested his visit to New York in 1948. So, we had, and we'll return to the term fascist by the very end of the world. As well as terrorist. 
Well, they use the word fascist in it. They used it in 48 in the New York Times. Uh, this was a very known term in 48. <laughs> it was not an exotic word. So, um, uh, the terrorist is something else, but fascist is, uh, uh, I think, who weighs a lot more. Uh, so, the uh, in, starting from 1977, you have uh, governments, uh, quite a few governments, uh, that every successive government becomes somewhat more to the right than the previous one. So it's, it's a very clear trend, with a few interruptions of labor governments, but even the labor governments were also moving to the right. So in fact, you have a whole society moving to the right. Now, how does it express itself? Uh, well, first of all, the privatization of kibbutz. Kibbutz has been privatized, by and large. And uh, near Netanya, where I just spent three months, uh, you have a very interesting, I think, monument to kibbutz. Uh, they leased their land to a huge shopping center. So you have a huge shopping center built on the land of the kibbutz. Uh, uh, with, you know, Zara and uh, all this brand names you have here in Hrishyatik, and uh, they're there um, in this shopping center. Uh, another uh, sign is, of course, the economic policy. Uh, the economic policy of Israel has changed quite a bit. Uh, it was a very egalitarian society in the 1960s, with very few poor people, very few rich people, it was rather equal. I'm talking about non-Arabs in Israel. Arab is something else. Uh, today, Israel occupies the shares the first and second place with the United States among OECD countries uh, in terms of economic inequality, which is quite high in terms of economic inequality. And we may ask, how was it possible to turn the Israeli society? from an egalitarian ethics to a very inegalitarian one. And uh, one should explain it only one way, the same way that Winston Churchill expressed in the 1920s. Nationalism distracts from social economic issues. If you are a strong nationalist, you say, well, it's temporary. We have to, we have to develop the nation. And, the nation, and then we'll take care of social and economic problems. That's how you move to the right without significant protest in Israel. In Israel, you had a protest in 2012, I think. It lasted a few months uh, in Tel Aviv against the rising prices and against austerity. 2011. Huh? 2011, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 11, maybe. Rothschild. Rothschild. Rothschild, yeah. Uh, so it was there, and, but it lasted for a few months, it, it petered out, um, and it didn't bring any significant changes. Except uh, it's a Kshmule in uh, Avodah, the yeah. head of this protest. No, it brought significant changes to the leaders of the movement, but it didn't bring significant changes to the people. Now he is dead, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, you have this, it's very important to understand that this turn to the right economically was facilitated by the fact that Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu who was finance minister in the late 90s and became prime minister, uh, could do it by fomenting nationalist passions and say, well, we are surrounded by enemies, we have to face the enemy, and therefore, we leave it for later, the economic issues and social issues. And the people largely accepted it. Uh, so uh, I think it's a very effective means of uh, transforming, of implementing austerity measures, and that's why right-wing European movements are also admiring Israelis for that, not only for the way they treat Arabs, but also for the way they affect economic policy and turn the economy to the right. Like you said, um, the, um, actually, Ben Gurion himself, he told that Zionism just a tool to conquer the land, and after the middle class was built, it was no longer 
as needed. Yes. Uh, uh, the social. You yeah, got it. You got it right. You got it right. It was an instrument, and it was used, and uh, it's like scaffolding. You, know, you build a building and scaffold. Just from the middle class. Well, you need offer, a scaffold. Offer, offer, offer right. new, offer new, um, I don't know, new form, a new age. I don't think I get what you're saying. Um, I mean that um, after uh, regaining conquering the land, um, the uh, Zionists began began to form kind of intellectual middle class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you build a middle class, uh, middle class isn't actually um, mm, isn't actually uh, that, that doesn't have uh, the need to be socialist because well, be, because socialism is kind of a movement for working class. Well, it's, uh, here we're opening. It. We can open a discussion later because I think that uh, you put together middle class and intellectuals, and they're not the same thing. No, they're not, they're not the same thing. <laughs> so, in fact, among intellectuals uh, and among middle class, you have a tremendous yeah. support for socialism and social justice uh, in yeah. many countries. So it's not, it's not the, the issue is not, in fact, support, from, support for the Labour Party in Israel comes from the wealthiest part of the society. And those who vote for the coup are the poorest part of society. Uh, that's the paradox of, uh, because they are, even though they are poor, but they also they're nationalists. Mm -hmm. And so they would vote for recruit uh, as the expression of their nationalist thesis uh, and being, uh, being uh, patient uh, to wait for the improvement of their economic lot. Uh, and I think you find this in quite a few places in the world. Uh, so Israeli society, in fact, as a result, has become very fragmented. Um, it's fragmented along many lines. It's fragmented among Israeli-born and those who immigrate, between Arabs and non-Arabs, between uh, and of course, poor and rich. And here we get to the objective criteria of how do we measure it. And there is a, it's called the Index of Human Development. The Index of Human Development is published by the United Nations uh, according to statistics of supplied by the countries. And Israel comes out pretty good. It's 22nd on on the among 177 nations that supply this information. But it's only non-Arab Israel. And when you include Arabs, it falls to 66 place. Uh, which shows how great the contrast is. Um, Israeli Arabs constitute about 20% of the population, but they own only 3% of the land. And the gap between the two populations is also a gap uh, in educational expenses. Because education, as you, some of your students here, understand education is usually seen as a vehicle for social advancement. Uh, uh, the expenditure on education for one Arab student is $192 versus $1,100 for non-Arab students in Israel. So it's almost well, it's more than six times more. So this creates also a gap that you can see in infant mortality, which is twice as high among Arab children than um, among non-Arab children. Uh, and. Uh, per capita GNP of Palestinians uh, in the territories that Israel controls is about 15 times lower than that of Israelis. So we're talking about huge contrasts uh, of, uh, which coincide with ethnic lines, uh, which is also very important. Uh, now, today, as I was in Israel earlier this year, I also found that I don't have it in my article, 
that one third of the children in Israel live under the poverty line. Uh, that's even more than the United States. The United States is about 20%. One third is. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Do you know the um, uh, the percentage of children in same uh, index from the early years? Of the human uh, development. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I took the most recent one, but okay. you could, it's available in the United Nations. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, website. Um, so it's available to get numbers from 1948? No, no, it started maybe 15 years ago. Uh, in, in human development index is a rather recent invention. And the numbers ever seen so are all available? For the last 15 years, I'm sure they are. And they're really long line. Uh, so these socioeconomic disparities go in parallel with the intensification of sentiment of discrimination. Uh, how is it expressed? Uh, It's expressed uh, in public opinion. Public opinion is against, for example, if you ask non-Arab citizens of Israel uh, whether they would like to live, be neighbor, have neighbors as Arabs, and they would say over one half says no, we don't want to have neighbors as Arabs. Uh, there was uh, a few years ago uh, quite a bit of commotion in Israel because uh, there was a petition set, uh, signed by 300 state-paid rabbis, official rabbis, not ultra-orthodox, what they call, but okay, state-paid rabbis. Uh, and this petition, they said that uh, uh, apartments and houses should not be rent or sold to Arabs. Uh, of course, the ultra-orthodox vigorously were against it because they said, well, if that's what we treat Arabs, the Jews will be treated the same way. Imagine if in Paris or Kiev you would say, well, I don't rent to a Jew. We actually saw that in the past. So it's not something new. Um, so there was understandable um, outcry in Israel about this. But none of the, it's very interesting, um, uh, it's very interesting that in, in Israel, uh, the issue of discrimination divides also non-Arab population. So you have Israeli journalists and intellectuals uh, who are protesting this. And there is interesting new connections between left-wing intellectuals and the ultra-Orthodox Haredi circles. Um, Israeli legislators today openly call for erecting a Zionist barrier against the use of human rights claims at the expense of Israeli patriotism. So what it means is, say, in the parliament, in Israeli Knesset, you have various legislative initiatives that say, don't use, we will forbid using human rights issues as an attack on Israeli patri patriotism. Uh, some of these laws are invalidated later by the Supreme Court, some are not, but it created a very interesting debate within Israel. And uh, I checked who uses the word fascist with respect to this trend. Uh, I expected it to be used by sort of anti Zionist, extreme left circles. Well, it's not quite the case. Um, as I said, Albert Einstein, Hannah Arendt, you, you had used this term for Menachem Begin, whose party has been in power for a few decades now. Uh, uh, but then we take uh, uh, two Israeli uh, journalists, uh, Amir Achaz and Gideon Levy, who are uh, uh, journalists for the Haaretz newspaper, and they have used it quite often. But it's also used by mainstream academics, politicians, and journalists. Uh, a committed Israeli Zionist wonders if his country has become, it has, is becoming fascist. Uh, 
uh, his fellow Zionist, J.J. Uh, Goldberg, uh, who is a journalist in the United States, um, uh, who is very, very strong Zionist, he said that fascism may be a strong word, but this is not what should be happening in a country that calls itself Jewish. Uh, so he feels very uncomfortable with this. Um, a well-known Israeli political scientist concluded uh, that Israel's gravest danger today is the one it faces from within, fascism. And that's again, it's not the left-wing Gordon, it's not a left-wing uh, And finally, uh, the one who accused, or who diagnosed rather, uh, the emergence of fascism in Israeli society is none other than uh, Herzog, who was, who came second in the election uh, last month. Um, uh, he actually said, and I quote, uh, he had said, fascism is touching the margins of our society, but a year later he said that fascism was no, fascism was no longer a marginal phenomenon, but had become rooted in Israeli society. And that's, uh, that's Herzog. Um, uh, A retired Israeli judge admitted the emergence of apartheid and fascism in his country. Um, and it's quite interesting that accusations of fascism uh, have become very, very common. Uh, the head of the Association of Civil Rights in Israel uh, has, says that Israel has become, I quote, the most racist state in the developed world. Um, so these are the debates in Israeli society that reflect the strength to the right. And uh, it's quite clear that this trend is there to stay because the question has been debated whether this trend can be arrested by legislative measures, by laws, by Supreme Court, who is by and large more liberal than the parliament. Uh, but this, um, and the conclusion that has been reached in legal circles and in, in, among sociologists as well, that this trend is so rooted in the experience of Israeli society that no law would possibly prevent this from happening because the law would go against the social trend and the, and the law can do only so much if, uh, if society moves in the other direction. Uh, you cannot really change that move by legislative uh, measures, in particular by interpretations by, uh, by the judges. Uh, so these anti-Arab attitudes, which are part of this uh, right-wing trend, uh, are also grounded in uh, the way that uh, Arab citizens of Israel are presented in Israeli textbooks. So there was a study done by, of Israeli, you must, you must have heard about Palestinian textbooks, but here was a similar study done on Israeli textbooks. Uh, and uh, in textbooks in disciplines like history, geography, and civics, approved by the Ministry of Education, are full of simplistic good guys versus bad guys accounts. So you, have, you have, don't operate with concepts of different people in the same country, you see good guys and bad guys. And uh, this is also interesting, that's a characteristic of the right-wing trends in today's world, generally, that you don't argue in terms of interest, you don't argue in terms of uh, political concepts, you argue in moral terms. And I think it's President Reagan was one of the first to use the term the evil empire, empire of evil. And today it has become very common that there are good guys and there are bad guys. And depending on where you are, you can name your own bad or white good guys. But the fact that debate, particularly foreign policy debate, is no longer rational, but it, it has become, the discourse has become essentially moralistic. Uh, and it applies a very large scale today. Uh, you can hear it. Uh, certainly from the Harper government in Canada, which is one of the prominent uh, users of this moral, uh, moralistic discourse, uh, but you also see it in the United States and, and elsewhere. 
so going back to the textbooks, uh, I quote what the, the author of that study, and uh, she said, uh, with such distorted pictures and skewed maps firmly fixed in their minds, Israeli Jewish students are drafted into the army to carry out Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, whose life world is unknown to them, and whose very existence they have been taught to resent and fear. So in other words, the, according to the study, the presence of Palestinians in Israel and even in the territories that Israel controls is seen as something to resent and fear. They're there, but they really shouldn't be there. So in an ideal state of affairs, they shouldn't be there. Uh, and that, of course, creates certain attitudes among young people who today in Israel may be the most extreme, in fact, uh, in terms of sociological surveys. Uh, what you find is a lot of uh, very uh, extreme statements from the young people. Uh, now, a study, a booklet, rather, of issued by the Ministry of Education, and it has 100 basic concepts that students should know about Israel. And this booklet was published in 2011. Uh, and among those 100 basic concepts, Arabs are not mentioned at all. Uh, they constitute 22% of the population of the state. Uh, none of them is worthy of mention, even in the derogatory way. The booklet simply erased Israel's Arab citizens completely. Only in the context of the wars of Israel is the actual word Arab used. Thus, every child, child will know that an Arab is not a partner, not a citizen, or part of democratic society, but an enemy. Uh, and this is, I think, a very interesting trend because ethnic uh, fragmentation combined uh, with uh, presentation of the other as an enemy even though they're citizens, they have the right to vote, and actually the Arab party came out third in this recent election. Uh, don't forget, they got about 14 seats, 13 or 14 seats. Um, uh, it is a presence that no one even considered for building a coalition. So the third party, and no both, no one considered them as coalition partners because they're they are not Zionists. They're not Zionists and therefore they're outside of the Zionist consensus. So in other words, uh, the rights of Arabs are um, not protected at all? Well, they are protected by the courts. They are protected by the courts. But the social reality and particularly educational reality is different. If you're interested, we are close to the end, just we'll get because uh, you told me to speak for an hour and 20 minutes, and then we'll have a, few, a little time for, for questions. But that's a very important thing, how legally it can be protected. Uh, now, there is a new phenomenon in Israel that, uh, what they call the movement of Tag Mechir. I don't know Tag Mechir, that anyone heard of that? Uh, Tag Mechir is... Ah, a, a price. There is a price, yeah. It means there is a price. That's how it translated. It's a vigilante group, it's a militant group, that commits acts of violence, usually against Palestinians, but also this gentleman found a bomb on his doorstep in Jerusalem, uh, and actually blew up, but he was not terribly damaged. Uh, so there is a, a growing violence uh, of non-organized nature, uh, it's certainly not state violence, uh, by people because who have arms, who have access to arms, who have access to explosives, uh, and they use it quite often. Um, for example, uh, uh, a few months ago, a bilingual school, a Jewish Arab school in Jerusalem was bombed by this Tag Mahir group. Different mosques in the town. Mosques as well, but I'm talking about Jerusalem. It's in the center of Jerusalem, I know, in Baka. 
So are they attacked? Excuse me, they attack not only Arabs. Yeah. Well, this is a mixed school organized mm -hmm. by. So they attack like left, uh, left yeah. people. Yeah. 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 It's so. Yeah. You see, when you have this vigilante violence, it usually begins with attacking the enemy, but it always ends with attacking your own. <laughs> see, that's a logical event. Uh, so what sort of the state is doing? Well, the state arrested the perpetrators. Uh, Israeli secret services have a whole department, Jewish vigilante, and they have agents. But they can just to destroy this organization. Well, what they did, this movement. But what is interesting is they arrested those perpetrators of the bombing of that school in Jerusalem, that that whose only crime is that they have Arab and is Jewish yeah. students, yeah. Mm -hmm. Arab and non-Arab students mm -hmm. together. So they were arrested, and the judge, uh, uh, in considering the, uh, the penalty for them, did not accept the prosecution argument that this is a terrorist movement. He said, no, it's a random violence, and therefore the terrorist movement, terrorist activation was removed, and that makes it, you know, you go in the street and you flap somebody, just flap on the face, and so the state, Israel, that you want to say, the, do not, does not recognize uh, Jewish terrorism. It does recognize it on the level of ser secret service because they do, they have penetrated it, and they are very concerned. It's actually an old concern because in the 80s uh, there was a group that wanted to blow up the mosques on the Temple Mount, and the Shin Bet penetrated those groups and they arrested them before they could. But actually, they were moving with explosives in the car, and they were arrested, well, because they were all penetrated by the... <laughs> so the secret uh, services are just blind for this civilization? No, no. They, they do penetrate them, they do try to stop, but then when it goes to the legal system, it depends on the judge. The uh -huh. judge can accuse you of terrorist activity or can accuse so you judge, of violence. The judge could be very right. You can have all kinds of judges. What about the mass media? Huh? Well, but the mass media, again, they're divided and fragmented. So if you look at Haaretz or Yodak Ranot, uh, it would be one thing. And if you look at Israel Hayom, it would be very different. So you have uh, a different situation there. So uh, going back to the question of this right-wing trend, I would like to say a few words about uh, the question of how serious it is. You know, how serious is this trend? because perhaps it's not as serious. And I looked at um, the question of rootedness of that movement. You, know, you can have extremists who are marginal, or you can have extremists who are real rooted. So that makes a difference. Uh, and I would quote the director of the Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who in my opinion provided the most according depiction of this trend. Uh, the wild propagandists of the right, I quote, do not hesitate to use imagery and explanations taken from the anti-Semitic lexicon of Europe. Foreigners spread disease and take Jewish women. Black refugees are violent criminals who endanger public safety. Israel today is becoming slowly and increasingly swept up in redemptive xenophobia. To an increasing number of Israelis, the Arab, the African refugees, and people who are foreign in their religion, skin color, or nationality, are considered the most serious problem society has to solve on the road to peace and tranquility. So in other words, we would live in peace and tranquility if only we didn't have Arabs, foreign workers, and then we'll be have peace and tranquility. This is a classical anti-Semitic argument that Jews faced in the 19th century and 20th century. Speaking of people of color, uh, not only uh, well, people of color, of color but Arabs, what is the uh, percent of um, color workers? Well, well, there's quite a few African workers, mm -hmm. and quite a few Filipino workers, and, the and, there, and, there, and also Ethiopian Jews, 
Yeah, who, who, was, who found themselves really, look, again, I, I'm giving you my impression, it's not a sociologically grounded statement. Uh, every time I went to any building, any toilet, the people who cleaned it were always black. Uh, it's, it's a non-scientific observation, but it's quite an, it's an impression I have. Always, always, invariably. I didn't know whether they were African or Flashes, I mean, that's, you know, I didn't speak with them, but that's what you see. Um, it's not the case in the United States. Uh, so, uh, one of the issues, and I think you mentioned it, is the fact that Israel defines itself as a Zionist, well, as a Jewish and democratic state, which essentially is a Zionist definition. A few months ago, the, from a few months ago, there is a law that Israel is finally in the in Knesset was. Yeah. So there, there are several, in fact, there are several legislation measures that declare that Israel is a Jewish and a democratic state. Uh, and there is also a very problematic statement, particularly for others, is that the state of Israel is a state of the Jewish people. Uh, which, if you are not part of the Jewish people, which are at least 22%, but I think there are more than that, uh, you feel outside of the state board, outside of the state ideology, you are kind of tolerated minority. Uh, and uh, this is a serious issue which is openly de debated in Israeli society. One thing I can say is that Israeli society is very open about discussing those issues, much more so than uh, Zionists in other countries who feel that they have to support Israel right or wrong. Uh, in Israel they don't have this, of course, and they can discuss it much more openly. And I could see that uh, in in various forums that I visited during my recent stay, but even before, uh, they were debating, in fact, the issue, a very simple issue, what is a Jewish state? And as someone said, what is a Jewish state? What's a Jewish table? A table made by a Jew, a table made for a Jew, a table that has kosher food on it. What is a Jewish table? <laughs> what is a Jewish state? A state populated, majority of Jews, state run by Jewish law, a state, but we don't know. Uh, and it's particularly difficult because if it becomes part of law and no one knows what it means, uh, it opens the way to tremendous arbitrariness. Then you, could def you can define the way you like. Uh, so Israel today is very vigorous. Uh, society that is trying to debate these issues, to come to grips with these issues. Uh, but what is very present and what I think fuels this movement to the right is the sense of victimhood. See, one of the things that fuels this right-wing trend in Israeli society is the sense of victimhood, meaning that the history of genocide and actually the history of Jews in Europe, uh, in Christian Europe, is used as the late motif of practically all historical teaching. Uh, the history of Jews presented in Israeli schools as a history of suffering. Uh, and suffering ends with the foundation of the State of Israel 69 years ago. 69. 67, 67, 67, 67. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a serious problem. It's a serious problem that Israelis are not perfectly aware of. Uh, and uh, the victimhood, the sense that we are eternal victims, that anti-Semitism is permanent and impossible to end, is something that uh, many non-Arab Israelis share. And uh, there was a survey done in Israel about the content of Jewish education. Not Israeli education, but Jewish education. 
and they asked what are the important things to be taught to children about Jews. And I think about 90% said that number one item is the history of Holocaust. Not Kashrut, not Shabbat, not, but the victimhood. And in fact, um, it's a regular practice in Israel to bring soldiers, to bring students, to bring school children to the extermination camps in Europe, uh, to Auschwitz and other places. Uh, and of course, you know, it's, it's a very traumatic experience. Uh, so for many, as, as a, if I may quote uh, an Israeli uh, sociologist, Mikhail, he says, the Nazi genocide has long been used to justify the existence and the necessity of the state and has been mentioned in the same breath as proof that the state is under a never-ending existential threat. So in other words, say, Jews have been under threat, and today we are under threat from the environment. You know, the state of Israel is, is surrounded by enemies and all that. Uh, so this historic victimhood has come to confer a privileged status. And uh, this is something that characterizes Israeli society to a very large extent. To summarize, and we'll get to the questions in a moment, uh, to summarize, I'd say that we have a very, uh, I would say, instructive case of a country built on socialist economic principles, certainly, uh, built by people honestly committed, perhaps not the leaders, but people who were actually doing it, the pioneers, honestly committed to build a new egalitarian society to which they succeeded to a very large extent. Uh, and then a move that was affected by, uh, uh, particularly by the Likud party, towards a more nationalistic, more exclusive, and more economically unequal. So in fact, here we have the whole program of the right, both in economic and nationalist terms, that is carried out very successfully in Israel, with very little s resistance from the population. And that is why, I repeat, Israel has become the darling of the right, where it was used to be the darling of the left. <laughs>